Welcome to a very special edition of the Big Footy Tiger Cast, and it's nice to be back after a win on the weekend against Port Adelaide. Uh, against the odds, it must be said, um, I'll put out a public apology straight off the bat that I had written this off last week, along with uh, probably a lot of other supporters, uh, but the boys really pulled through and played a sensational match, which we'll get to after. We're joined by our, well, I reckon you've had the most appearances bar me, Grok, so welcome to the show, mate. Uh, nicely back, and yeah, I think I think a lot of them have been uh, fill-ins for people who have failed, I think, at the moment. So, yeah, we do invite you on off your own, mate. We don't just use you as a backup, but uh, <laughs> yeah. no, appreciate you coming on all the time. Our next guest is one of our biggest fans on Twitter, and it's kind of funny when I then work out who they are on Big Footy, and it's yeah, it's because <laughs> otherwise I've got no idea who's commenting on stuff. I'm just joining in the banter. Uh, but Tiger Flag, welcome to the show, mate, for your first episode. Yeah, thank you very much, Michaels, and uh, good day, uh, Crocodile and Red. Nice to yeah, be hey, here. Mate. And he's dropped the Hello. bombshell before I could even introduce him, but that's okay. And our third <laughs> guest is making a very special guest appearance for us, is Rhett Bartlett. Rhett, welcome to you, mate. Hello, everyone. Do, uh, do I call everyone by, like, your big footy name or your Twitter oh, well, name? I'm really, I'm so confused. Uh, typically speaking, it's just the big footy name, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Like, people know who <laughs> well, I am by now if they haven't worked I'm it R. Bartlett. That's me, then. Yes. <laughs> very <yeah>. original. <laughs> It was funny, when I was trying to tag you in like a, a post or something, I'm like, Brett, I'm, have I spelt this wrong? And then I realised, yeah, it was just R. Uh, Bartlett. So, yeah, that took me a little while to, to work that there, one. There was a phase there too where someone was, people were pretending to be me, which I thought was hilarious. So, oh. um, I'm like, wow, I've made it, yay. Maybe it was that guy from Fox Footy. <laughs> the, the Fox Footy EP who didn't like my comment about Game of Thrones and Fox Footy's tie-in coverage, which was just <laughs> awful. No, and I'm that not was... sure if you listened to our episode last week. I'm tipping you had better things to do, Rhett. But one of the guys actually teed off on that exact topic that it was an absolute oh. joke to um, yeah. make the players dress up in ridiculous outfits and tied <laughs> in like that. So that's why your tweet really did appeal to a lot of us. <laughs> I'm not the only one. That's all right. I'm happy about that. But the good news is, everyone, is Rhett has saved the tweet that uh, the Fox footy person <laughs> yes. deleted. So he's got ammo up his sleeve if needed. Well, he... Strangely, he went. He went at me. He went at my dad's radio ratings on SEN, which I don't give two shits about. And um, uh, and I'm like, okay. And I just said, maybe you should just have a round where Fox Footy focuses on actually broadcasting post-match celebrations. And um, <laughs> I don't think he liked that. He deleted his tweet. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he was under strict instruction not to get into That's a great, tweetable yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, but, uh, the, I, I digress. Sorry. No, it was a good, good bit of banter. I'll be keeping a close eye on uh, any retweets that pop up of that one. Yeah. But the main reason we've got you on, Rhett, is obviously you have uh, re well, updated your book, The Richmond FC, The Tigers, which is um, just an epic historical book about the club. Before we get into the book, though, what was the inspiration in getting into the historical research part of the Richmond Footy Club? Uh, well, you probably, you, I'm guessing you probably think it's my dad. Um, but mainly about, oh, in 1990, uh, well, let's see, late 1990s, uh, my family came across an old medal, which had inscribed on it, A. Sultan, Richmond Football Club, 1888. And so that sort of triggered me off trying to figure out who this A. Sultan was. And I sort of reached out to the club, to Bill Meeklin. You might've heard of Bill. He's a the historian at the club, um, and it sort of started from there, sort of trying to figure out who this old time player was in 1888. And from there, I sort of started researching all of the club's history from that time. And then around about 2000, I discovered I couldn't really find any interviews with any of the old players like Jack Titus or even a proper sit down interview with Jack Dyer, where he was talking entirely about his career. So I sort of started writing to people, uh, pen and paper. Uh, asking to former players if they wanted to talk about their memories of Richmond. And so they said yes, and I would carry around my little tape recorder, which I still have, uh, before a digital recorder, and um, I would interview them about their, their memories of Richmond. And that's sort of how it became the book. That would have been fascinating, some of the stories you would have heard from some of these players, and some you may not have been able to put into books or anything like that. As in what you mean, some of the stories... Just the... Can't, yeah, I'm, can't I'm go sure to they, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there would have yeah. been some nuggets of gold there. 
Yeah, I had a rule. So when I interview footballers, I say, if at any stage you want me to stop the tape, tell me. And so it's been stopped. I think there were three three times it's been stopped by former players where okay. they've told me things that they didn't want to be on the record. Um, but the first part of your question, yes. Uh, I mean, I started I started with a list. I had a list of all the oldest living Richmond players, and I worked my way down. I thought that's I've got a that's the best way to attack this. And so the first person I interviewed was a guy called Joe Murdoch who lived in Castlemaine. And Joe had played on uh, Gordon Coventry. He played on Roy Kazali. So we're talking late 20s here. Uh, and so I went up to see um, old Joe Murdoch, as we would call him. And uh, I got lost on the way up to Castlemaine. And I went into the petrol station and I said, I'm trying to find this street. And the guy said, I don't know where, what that street is. And I said, I'm looking for a, a guy called Joe Murdoch. And he went, oh, old Joe. Yeah, just go down there, turn left at the roundabout. He's the third street on the right. See, everyone knew him in Castle <laughs> you really Yeah, he was the Yeah, he was the great Joe Murdoch who had played in two premierships and, you know, was a champion player with Castle and stuff like that. So yeah. I was lucky to speak to people like that. And Roy Wright came to our house. And I don't know if you ever saw Roy Wright. He's the, he was just huge, right? He was tall. And, I mean, they called him the gentle giant. And he arrived at our house in what had to have been the smallest car in the world. <laughs> have you ever seen that Simpsons episode where yeah. the big, tall basketball <laughs> guy comes out of the car? The first yeah. Pictured, yeah. yeah. That was Roy. Roy's, Roy just arrives in this car. And he, I'm like, okay, that's an entrance. Thanks. So when you make contact with, say, Joe, for example, who would have been out of the game for obviously quite a long time, what's his reaction when someone is wanting to speak to him about his Richmond career? Oh no, they're they're more than happy to, love it. They, I, they, they love I've found the same it. thing. Yeah. Like I've spoken to a few past players as well and done interviews, and I, I agree with you that they're always more than happy to you know reminisce about their time as a Tiger because they just love the club so much and they like talking about it. So no, that's good. You got a good reception. Yeah. I'm sure it would have been well, a, a shock for them as well to have someone come after them all these years later. Yeah. So uh, the ones who seem to be Really proud were, I, I mean, I reached out to people who played one game in 1945 or might have played three games in the early 50s. And they, they were just thrilled to be able to tell their story. And in a, in a lot of cases, their story is actually as significant as Murdoch's or Roy Wright's or Ron Branton's because they were there for such a short period of time, they remember everything. They remember who picked them up at the airport, who their locker was next to, meeting Jack Dye for the first time. All those memories are seared in their mind because they were there for, they might have only been there for four or five months before they went back to the country. And so every memory is, is stuck in their mind. I've, I've interviewed, um, I think I'm up to 145, oh, and I've only, had, I've only had two rejections. Um, so I've got a pretty good strike rate. <laughs> pretty unlucky to be the son of Kevin and they've knocked you back. Did you, play, um, did you play? Did you know who my dad is? Card after they knocked you back. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I have to admit, when I've when I write that, I still write letters, handwritten letters to them, and I start off by going, "My name's Rhett Bartlett, and I help out at the Richmond Football Club in the museum, and my father played for Richmond." Um, but the two people, it might surprise you, two people who have so, sort of said no. There was a a guy called Alan Cations who played fullback for Richmond, and I wanted to interview him because he played on John Coleman, um, and. He sent a reply back, his initial reply back. I keep all the letters that the players send me. That might go into a book one day too. Yeah, and he yeah. sent me a letter that said, uh, thanks for the offer, but but no, I'll decline. I'll, I'll reconsider when your father returns to Richmond. Oh, that, that's a bit Ooh. harsh. <laughs> no, that's fine. So uh, I take things on the cheek. That's fine. And um, so my dad then returned to Richmond, so I wrote a letter yeah. back. Yeah, well played. Uh, where he's, I said, he's back. <laughs> would you like to do an interview? Uh, and he said, no, look, I've got fond memories of Richmond, but I, I won't do an interview. No, thank you. So I said, okay, I won't push my luck on that one. Um, so he was one of the two. Yeah, it's a bit harsh. He, he did the right thing, went back to him. And, <laughs> That's yeah. all right. Oh, I'm, just, well. I'm just disappointed that no one got to interview him. Yeah, so especially at, at, like, with the position I know you, you do interviews too, which is fantastic. So I try not to – I don't – yours are sort of re- players of more recent memory too, which is fantastic because – I'm sort of going further back and you're sort of filling in the gap from more recent times too. So collectively yes. we're sort of getting there. We're just ticking them off one by one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now we'll move on to the book because it's, um, 
it's a massive book, almost 400 pages long. Uh, you obviously had a, an initial release. Was it in 2008, somewhere around that mark? Yeah, we didn't go too well that year either, which was a bit disappointing. Well, you could have picked any uh, year from some, any time before 2017, <laughs> and you could have said the same yeah, thing. But, well, how, um, about, how, about, how about Conrad Marshall? He writes a book and they win a premiership. Oh, no. Yeah, that, <laughs> that must really shit you when that happens. <laughs> no, I was great. Because his publisher is my publisher, and on grand final day I was there and I went up to Jeff. I said, Jeff, you've got your book. I said, you've, it's going to be a sellout. Everyone's going to get it now. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. He, he couldn't have scripted that any better if he tried. Uh, uh, incredible. And uh, so yeah, in 2008, I did the book and I haven't done an update since. So this update includes chapters with, so I interviewed uh, Damien Hardwick, Peggy O'Neill, Neil Baum with a beard. Um, <laughs> that's a great beard too, isn't it? Fantastic. Like he, Orson Welles. He must be. Yeah. <laughs> For those listeners who know who Orson Welles are, sorry, I don't know how old your listenership is. But anyway. uh, yeah, I'm old enough to appreciate <laughs> Orson are, right? Welles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a relief. Um, <laughs> and then I also, so I sort of captured the masterminds of Richmond's premiership flag, um, and they've got their own individual chapters, their oral history. Did that and include then... Mrs. Hardwick, because she was one of the masterminds? <laughs> um. You know what? I was thinking of actually sending an interview request to her, and I didn't. Oh. So, has she been interviewed, actually? Not that I'm aware of. I don't think Conrad interviewed her, did he? Uh, no, he didn't. There might have been references, but not a direct yeah. conversation. She's she's a, a key figure in Richard's premiership, isn't she? Well, I mean, the the speech after <laughs> the game on the podium said all, doesn't it? That's right. How about, it's, how it's, about all these references yeah. to her throughout the year? <laughs> Well, some fellas even made up some uh, We Love Mrs. Hardwick t-shirts. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Fantastic. I wonder, I wonder if they ended up getting one themselves. Um, Surely you spent at the club. Yes. Uh, and then uh, I, there's a couple of extra interviews too. Um, one with Derek Pearden, who's Richmond's first Indigenous player ever. Um, he played in the 60s. And, and a lady called Jan Richmond, who was Graeme Richmond's widow. Um, and she talks about... Um, life with Graeme Richmond and having to, you know, uh, at the end of the season, GR and Ian Wilson um, meeting at a at their house to decide who gets the chop from the club, and you know who do you get who do, who moves on and who stays, and is it time for Tommy Hafey to move on and stuff like that. So her insights are really interesting about that time too. And how long did it take you to do the updates for this version? Uh, the update I did over the course of a year. Okay. So um, it, it was dependent also on uh, getting, as you would probably know this, it's easier to interview former players than current players. Absolutely. I've had zero luck <laughs> getting no. anyone current on, as you can imagine. You would have had more luck than I have, I'm sure. But um, well, yeah, not through yeah, lack I've of got, trying. It's, uh, it took, I've got, I finally got Trent Cochin to agree. Um, I mean, the book's already out now. But um, so I'll go through that. I'll, I'll do that chat in the coming week or so or two. So that took a while. But yeah, when I mean, they didn't really want to be interviewed during the season. And then I'm like, well, I've got to wait to the end of the season because it looks as though we might make, make the grand final again. And I've, that's got to go in the book. And then, as you know, the, pr the prelim final happened. And I'm like, well, I can't now just message in the next day going, hey, let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So I now got to put a bit of gap between. So it took, in total, it took about a year because there's also um, – I had to source some – there's new photographs in the book too and there's a whole new uh, historical section where we've compiled a list of every Richmond player from 1885 to now, which has never been in print, uh, and there's been some big changes to Richmond's honour board as well, um, which is in there as well. I don't think the club's made any announcement yet, so I'll just leave it at that and see if anyone notices yet. <laughs> Such a jam-packed full of new information. Um, yes. The other thing I want to ask you about is the the cover of the book, which is the the old school Richmond uh, jersey with your type at the front. What was the inspiration or the reasoning behind that particular photo? Well, that's uh, the Guernsey of Roger Dean, um, the the now Richmond immortal and mm. the premiership captain himself. So the Guernsey was in the Richmond Museum. I don't. Has anyone been to the Richmond Museum? Not for a long time, not since it's been redone. Yeah, so it's been, it was put in storage not long after the premiership, which wasn't 
great timing. And um, it's been – they're reopening it now above the Richmond uh, merchandise store, the superstore. Mm. So if anyone's listening and they go to the club next time, just you go up the stairs one level. and So it's the level underneath the Morris Rioli room or the level above the, the Richmond superstore. Um, so that will house – a lot of the Guernseys, and so that was Roger Dean's Guernsey. In the first book, it was inside the book, that photo. Um, yes. And we just love It's just so evocative because it's it's a close-up of your, your old lace-up Guernseys, which, uh, uh, well, my, my father's one's in the, the MCG Museum, um, and it just gives you an idea of just how, even hanging by a thread it is, it's just a, you know, a lace-up canvas Guernsey. But it looks great. No, it does. It looks fantastic. It's a fitting image for the cover of the book. Have you ever uh, seen a lace-up? Has anyone ever seen or felt a lace-up Guernsey? Not in person, no. If you can, they're, in, they're rather incredible. Dad's one was um, he lost the, um, the lace, so um, he, he just replaced it with a shoelace. Okay. And uh, he played the majority of his career just with a shoelace holding the thing together. And he had a little handkerchief I discovered not long ago. He had a little sort of handkerchief um, sewn in on the inside of his Guernsey. Right. So he could just clean his hands and of sweat and that sort of thing, which I didn't know until he told me. Okay, yeah. so he's, just, he's an innovator. <laughs> some, some, some don't call him that, I assure you. <laughs> have, you read, have you read Big Footy? <laughs> Anyhow. Oh, the Richmond board, we love him. He's, oh, he's the Richmond all... board's fine, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, he's absolutely. Always, he's always one of us, sorry about that. There's an, SE, there's an SEN thread board, I was just posting on it before. That's always interesting. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah but give me you, some interesting comments. We we love him you, because you're... at the start of every year, he comes out and shake hands yeah. Carlton and, and predicts some yeah. extraordinary <laughs> margin. Like, I really hope he nails it one day. Is it not the greatest thing of all time? It's fantastic, isn't it? He's like he'll send me he'll send me a text. He'll say uh, I tip Carlton, I tip Richmond today by a hundred points against Carlton. You'll <laughs> get it right one day. We'll, we'll get there. No, 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 no. I don't want him, I don't want him to get it right because we're not going to hear the end of it then. Are oh, we? okay. okay. <laughs> he'll be like, I, did it. I told you I'm the world's greatest tipster, and I'm like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> well, like him and his Melbourne Cup trifecta. <laughs> <laughs> like me, he's probably never forgiven Carlton after that 1972 grand final. Yeah, or 1982. He blames the coach and Helen Domenico for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> we, we all blamed her for 37 years of shitness is pretty much what we That's put correct. that down she to. Was, we should have invited her to the to the flag, shouldn't we? As sort yeah. of like a, a peace offering. Yeah, I mean, it can't be a coincidence that she burns the, she burns that scarf the, the Thursday before the game and then we win the flag. What did she do? She burnt the, the scarf that she was carrying around. Did she yeah. really? Oh, yeah, the curse the, was lifted. <laughs> yeah, on, on the footy show, actually. They actually brought oh, her right. onto the footy show, grand final edition, and right. she came out with the scarf and threw it into a little uh, 44-gallon drum and they, they burnt <laughs> it on stage. That That is the reason we won. It's symbolic. It, yeah. 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 She yeah. should I be a life member now for that. <laughs> <laughs> We should we should invite her to like kick the ball at the start of the game through the goals. Yeah, the homecoming hero. <laughs> homecoming <Yeah>. hero. <laughs> Wouldn't that be brilliant? Just that's right. And she's wearing a scarf. I mean, she'll be wearing more clothes, obviously. But yeah, well, one, one and she could be home. sponsored by the Crazy Horse again. That's sort of. Thing. I'm sure we can organise something with the club. Co-sponsorship. Yeah. Uh, back to the the research part of you mentioned before that you obviously hand wrote a lot of letters and sent it out. But I'm guessing that a lot of your research you would have come across some stumbling blocks with players who have sadly passed away and you must have had to have gone through their family um, to get information. How did they react to being contacted and was that a hard way to have to try and find out information for your research? Um, yeah, I think, well, there's two points there. So there were there were several players who I didn't get to before they died. Um, so Mike Patterson I didn't get to before I died. he died. He was only in his, in his 60s. Um, and so that was incredibly frustrating because you felt you just you always felt like you were running out of time. That you had all these people you wanted to interview, and then you're reading the paper that so and so passed away, and he was seventy or sixty, and you'd, it just it sort of knocked you around a bit because you just you just wish that he had been interviewed by someone like same with Jeff Strang, 
who played in Richmond's Premiership in '67 and '9, I think. He was, you know, he was part of the Strang family. There was Doug Strang and all those sort of things. Um, and I didn't get to interview him, and I don't know if there was many interviews done by him. So, when you reach out to family members, they're 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 very grateful for the contact because the, the I, I think they're grateful that their relative isn't going to be forgotten. Um, like, do you remember one or two years ago the club bestowed life membership on all Premiership players? Yep. Yes. yes. They did it. They did it retrospectively. Um, so. I'm on the historical committee, so we, we discuss all this and then we put, you know, recommendations to the board, that sort of thing. And so they, the board said, uh, here's the idea we've got, and they, they did it. And then they came back to us. They said, now you've got to find the relatives of all the former players. And I went, oh, here we go. So with the help of some of the big footy people, actually. Sorry, that's my dog. Uh, with the help of some of the big footy people, uh, we went through um, Ancestry.com and that sort of thing. We tracked down relatives and these include relatives of people who played in the 1943 premiership who say thanks for reaching out to us because we thought the club had completely forgotten about our father or our grandfather who played back in the 40s um you know ron durham played fullback for richmond in the 1943 premiership and uh he died a young man he was electrocuted in his greenhouse at home and his family came to this um, function that we held at the club and his daughter was there and she, she was crying because she couldn't believe that the club was still remembering um, her father after all these years. And so, you know, it makes it all sort of worthwhile. And um, every time I do an interview and it's, I record them and I've been putting them up online now too. So there are, I've got a SoundCloud page called raw podcast. So I put the, the entirety of the interview up on online for people to listen to. And I've had family members email me saying, can I have a copy of that tape? Because uh, like Roy Wright's son, Paul Wright, messaged me and said, I'm, can I have a copy of that tape? Because my father was saying things on that tape about my family that he would never tell us face to face. You know, mm-hmm. So you, you, you're recording history and you inadvertently you're not realising at the time you're also helping, I think, families – in a sense, with a bit of a grieving process too. That's fascinating, and it, it's, you're doing such a good job um, reaching to all those families and, and making sure they do know the club and everyone is thinking of them and do recognise their efforts and contribution to the club. So, no doubt. And same to you as well, with you. with you reaching out to current players as well or recent players too. So well done on that. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's nice to be able to talk to them and connect with them and, and share their memories as well. It's it's good fun and, yeah. and supporters love hearing about it too because there's a lot of unheard stories that need to be told and it's um it's just a good a good forum to get it out yep. there. It is. Now the, the other project you've been involved in recently is Richmond obviously released our Anzac Eve Guernsey for 2019, which looks fantastic. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, jump onto the club's website. Uh, but one of the design features you had a part in, which is features on the back of the jumper, I believe. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I, it was only a very small part. Um, the club reached out to me. Ben Jenkins at the club, who I think is the marketing guru, reached out and said, uh, can I have a list of everyone at Richmond who went to war? And I said, oh, actually, I've been researching that. I've, I've done about two years of research, and that's now on my – I've got a website too called Tigerland Archive. And I said, it's on there. I'll send you the list. <laughs> and he messaged back going, I never realised the list was so long because we're talking Boer War, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam. And my list included everyone at Richmond from seniors, reserves, under-19s, those who trained with Richmond even, who, anyone who had a Richmond connection and went to war. So he replied back saying, uh, okay, I need to rethink this. Do we have a list of those who died at war? And we had that I think we've got about 13 players. So I sent him that list, and that's on the back of the Guernsey. In fact, I saw tonight that Melbourne's done a similar thing too. I don't know if you saw that. No, I haven't seen there. So they've they got present- something similar. Yeah, they presented a Guernsey to Ron Barassian on the back. They've got a list we forget, and those who have who's died, died at war. Richmond's list on the back. So when you see it, Richmond's list on the back is very unique because it includes not just senior players, there's players there from our VFA era and there's players there who played only reserves in the 1940s and went to war as like a 20 or 21-year-old and died. 
And there's even a, a, a name there f- from uh, the Richmond recruits, which was a junior side in the Richmond area. And he trained with Richmond because the club thought he was going to be a potentially a, a very fine player. And he went to war and died. So the list on the back of the, of the Guernseys is, is pretty special considering it covers all levels of the club as well. And I've reached out to all the family members of those as well, the ones we can track down. And they're just over the moon that their relative, who just played reserves for Richmond in 1940 or 42 or whatever, is, is being remembered. I can imagine, but as you know, a lot of people at the club always say, uh, once you're you know part of the club, you're always a part of the Richmond family. And I think doing that shows shows them that. So looking forward to... I know the club didn't... I don't think they posted a photo of the back of it, but I'm sure no doubt that's going to get some coverage at some point. So looking forward to seeing yeah. all the names I know it is. There. Is it, it is, yeah. No, it's on. It's on Twitter. I think they did. Yeah, I, I know. Oh, okay. I certainly posted one. So you can just go on my Twitter, which is retrospective. Um, but I will say one thing, if I can quickly, about the Anzac Guernseys. Yeah, clubs nearly have it. The clubs nearly have it right. There's this one thing that they need to do, and they need to remove all advertising off the Guernsey mm, for the yeah. for the Anzac round. And that's a bit of a sticking point at, at clubs, I think, because you've got the advertising people, et cetera, who say, well, you can't take the advertising off the Guernsey, et cetera. But my argument is if you remove NIB and you remove um, – who's on the front? Jeep, is it? Yeah. Jeep. If you remove yeah. Jeep off the front of the Guernsey just for the Anzac round, there would be more media coverage of that than just a normal everyday round where it's it's on there, correct? I think so because it – it would be against the grain, I guess, but also showing yeah. a lot more respect um, to those who served. Yeah, and, you, and on the website you can have an interview with, you know, the head of Jeep or the head of NIB explaining, you know, the reason behind it sort of thing. But just imagine the, the Anzac Guernseys as an actual clean, crisp Guernsey where you've just got the sash, the logo, the Anzac crest, uh, and then on the back you've got your names. There's no advertising at all. I think... There'll, there'll be a club that does that in the coming years and then everyone will follow suit, I'm certain of it. I, I, I like that idea and I've got no doubt you'll keep pushing that wherever possible <laughs> and I think it'd be great to see if we were the, the pioneers. I mean, the club really has got a good history of leading the way in various things and hopefully this can be another one of those yeah. things that we lead the way on. Yeah, I just think... Yeah, I know... I, look, I think there's people at the club who, who like the idea and but rightfully so, there's people there who, who think that's going to be a bit of a tough one to to push through. Um, but yeah, someone will. And then at some club and everyone will be like, yeah, let's do it. You are, you mentioned your website before Tigerland archive. Uh, the amount of information on there is jaw dropping. Um, for those who haven't been on there, make sure you visit the website. Not only will you find bios from every senior player uh, from 1908 till now, you've got goal kickers. There's the history of the Guernsey sponsors uh, and even a history on all tribunal reports. How, I mean, where would you even begin to look for some of the stuff like that? Oh, I just put Dustin Martin's name there each week in the tribunal report. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen how many <laughs> um, fines he's got? He's up to about 13 or something like that. I was looking through it a few days ago. Um, uh, well, a lot of the early history of, of that club on the on the website is done by was done by a guy called Trevor Riddell, who's the MCC librarian. So if you ever go into the MCG library, um, he, he's, he's there sitting behind a desk. So a shout out to him because his early work was astonishing. But then with your tribunal reports, there was a book put out many years ago which had some of the tribunal reports. So it's sort of taken from there. And then there used to be a site called Footy Stats, which was run by Kevin Taylor. Uh, that got shut down and all that information got lost, but I managed to sort of save the tribunal part of it. So you just use all different avenues and research. Thankfully now, a lot of the newspapers are online. You've probably heard of the Trove website. Yes. Which has which has Sporting Globe, Herald, The Age, Richmond Guardian, etc., all online. So I no longer really have to go to the State Library and scroll through microfilm in a dark room, thankfully. Um and you can also request newspapers as well. So I'm paying for the digitization of some of the years of the Richmond Guardian in the 19, during World War One, and in the 1920s. So that should be up in the next few months, I think, online. So it's just a matter of just, just sourcing all this information and putting it on the website. My favorite page on the website, but is the list of Richmond captains. Because the club put out a, 
an article last week with Tony Greenberg about um, Shane Edwards being, I think, the 105th captain of the club. Yep. And underneath that was the research I had done, which was every captain or acting captain in every game since 1885. So we know who captain in every game since the club's first um, match up until uh, now. That's remarkable to have the information. It's a bit of an effort. We got there. Um, and we think it's pretty much right. Look, there might be one perhaps acting captain we've got wrong in the 1930s or something like that. And, but until evidence sort of brings that up, we, we sort of go with what we've what we've discovered in the papers. Um, but it's a pretty strong list. And uh, Green has asked if he could publish it. And I, I, I've known Green has for years. And I said, yeah, that's not a problem. So um, I was glad that that sort of got out there and that Shane Edwards is, was also appointed captain too, which is nice. Yeah, very well deserved from Shane yeah. Edwards and got away with the win as well. So he's one from one and you, you'd almost hang up the boot. Well, not hang up the boots, but you'd <laughs> hand the captaincy back to someone else and say, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing that with a 100% record. Yeah, like, well, maybe we should just go through the team and get the next player then to, to, to captain and we just see how we go. Just like junior footy rotated each week. Do they still do that? I wonder. So, uh, younger age groups, I reckon they might because of the yeah. how PG everything is these days. But uh, I'm sure we could, you know, be the pioneers behind that and just yeah, rotate it around and until Koch is back on board. I captained once the Glen Waverley Rovers. Uh, I was nowhere near anywhere as good as as my father, uh, and uh, we lost. And I blame that on the fact that our Guernsey was Collingwood colours. That must have really <laughs> hurt you playing in that. <laughs> it's. Uh, yes, and I, and I couldn't even get number 29 either. That was taken by some other kid, so it was just not to be. Wow, that's sure. You've got to have a sense of occasion if you're that other kid and just hand it over. <laughs> <laughs> there was no sense of occasion back then, I can assure you. Speaking of well, the initials of your dad anyway, there's a, a new KB on board at the club now, and Katie Brennan. Is, uh, does that, <laughs> how does that sit with you having another KB there, and should she get the number 29 for the AFLW team? Oh, um, yeah, I, I think it's, you know what, I think they should, it should be, it's nice that they're doing that sort of initial comparison, but I think it should be a completely separate, she should start her own sort of journey away from the number 29 or something like that, I reckon. Fair enough. No, that's, that's a good call. Um, but it, it's totally up to her, but I, I, I think, you know, it's, it'd be good if, you know, Katie Brennan wears her own number or whatever it is and whatever junior number was and she sort of takes it from there and people make comparisons in the in the initials but i sort of feel a little bit uncomfortable about that hopefully she can kick just as many goals as him that'd be handy for us yeah not as many points thanks but as many goals that would be great to be honest all right well i might see did grok or tiger flag do you guys have any other questions for red before we have a crack at the preview well, I did ask once before, but I'm just wondering, uh, after we win the grand final this year, can I borrow your dad's statue? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problems. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> I just want to take a photo of it in my front lawn. <laughs> yeah, no, or, no or, better, or better yet, can I borrow your dad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, it's probably going to be easier to organise that, I think. Okay. Um, but <laughs> okay. There was a guy who... There was a guy on Twitter who posted a photo of my father. He was with my father at the front of the statue. And I said he's got the rare KB double. He's got the real KB and then the statue KB in the one shot, which is incredibly rare. So, um, I'll, look, I'll follow it up, okay? We'll see how we go. We've got to make grand final first. first. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yeah, that's, the question that I had The question that I had for Rat would be... Um, asking him what his favourite thing about writing the books were, whether it be, you know, educating the football public or interviewing past players or even contributing to the club history himself. What was my favourite part of it, of, of all of yeah, that? What's, uh, yeah, what's your favourite part of writing the books? Um, is uh, No, I, I think my favourite part is just... My favourite part is when I finish the interview and I know I've recorded it. And it's there. It's now there for posterity, if that makes sense. And so uh, I've always said that a book like this, an oral history book like this, is actually more important in 20 years' time or 10 years' time. So I get great joy in the fact that someone says, yes, I'm happy to be interviewed, and whether I go to their house or I interview them over the phone, and then I've got 
their memories and I can put into book form or I can put it online. And, you know, to, to sort of give that into a bit more perspective, I think in the last, what, five months, we've lost Ronnie Rifle, Fred Burge, Les Flintoff died. Um, there was another one who passed away. Uh, Havel Rowe passed away. All four of them I interviewed, all four of them had their own chapter in the book. Um, and so that sort of digs into me that it's important that we keep doing this, whether it's yourself or your podcast here or whether it's anyone listening, just keep interviewing and trying to get their memories. Like two weeks ago, I started interviewing um, some of the people who founded the Richmond Cheer Squad in 1961. They were just teenagers back then. So I've done two interviews at the moment with those members of the cheer squad about how it all came about and what was the first banner and what was the first chance that we chanted back then. So eventually that will go up on the, on the, the audio SoundCloud website uh, and probably make it into a later edition of the book. It was a good question. I like that. Could I, could I just ask a, a question there, Red? Is it about the could statue I... again? No, no, mate, no. Because no, <laughs> no, I was going to no. say, I'll, I'll see. <laughs> okay, no, no, not about that. I was going to say, with all, with all the effort you go to, and I mean, it's obviously not a consideration for you, but have you ever just had a think about how much time you actually spend doing all this um, this stuff? It, it, you know, it sounds uh, to me like yeah. you must spend a heap of time. Well, it's, yeah, well, it's just my hobby, really. You know, I, I work I work five days a week, and outside of that, you'll find me, I'll be looking through Trove websites or I'll be scheduling interviews um, or I'll be at the club with the museum with Roland Weeks, who's the curator. Mm. Um, I would think it, it's taken up a significant part of my life, certainly since 2000. Um, but, you know, I love it. So it's not really a hindrance for me at all. There are times when I burn myself out mm. and I can't do any more research. I literally look at the page and like, I just can't. And I might take a month off or two months off or whatever. And then something triggers me. I get an email or a tweet from someone to say, my great grandfather played for Richmond in so-and-so and away I go again. But there's a large chunk of it, of my life is just research in Richmond. And if you look at any footy club, those who you, you could argue that those who contribute the most to a footy club are those who volunteer like, like we've got boot studders at Richmond who have been there since the 70s, right? Um, and they've got full-time jobs. Um, so people who volunteer at football clubs are hugely important. And I think a lot of people don't always understand how much time they put aside to what they do. And mine's more like you don't see, I'm not, you don't see me on camera at the club. I'm not, I'm not at punt road every single day of my life. I'm not, with the inner sanctum or anything like that. So a lot of work I do is sort of behind the scenes on social media and on websites. So it's a more uh, a written word contribution that is sort of there that people can recognize me for. Well, I think I'll speak for everyone. We say, keep up the fantastic work, Rhett. It's, um, it's absolutely no fascinating problems. to see what comes out of these interviews uh, in the updated book. So, it's called Richmond FC, the Tigers, and it's available at the Tigerland Superstore, so make sure you head there before uh, one of the games at the MCG via the Slattery Media website and all good bookstores, and it is an absolute must-read for all Tiger fans out there uh, and anyone who just loves football history in general, and you can tell a lot of love and care has gone into doing this, um, and no stone was left unturned, and I think that comes through in the way you describe things here tonight and in the book itself, so a massive congratulations for the hard work you put in, mate. Well, that's very kind of you, and thank you to you all for your interest and also for your efforts as well. And uh, if you allow me, I'm just going to go and speak to Dad now about that statue thing, if that's all right. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> yeah. No drama at he all. Sleep. Yeah, I'll just go ask him now, and I'll come back to you on Twitter or something or, or on the big footy and tell you how he goes, okay? Sounds good. And pass right. on our best wishes to your Dad as well. We, we all love him. He's, he'll always be a tiger well, we for do. life, and we've got a lot of time for him. Yeah, he's still my favourite. Is he still your favourite? Is he really? Bloody eyes. Uh, what, did you wear his number at all when you were barracking? Or? Well, well, I even tried playing with his number on, but it was cursed. I didn't have, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have the skills. <laughs> you, saw what happened. you saw what happened to Tyrone Vickery. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And then there's, there's, only, there's only one person that can wear that number 29. Is it Brett Marnie? 
<laughs> I, I had a little bit of a fanboy moment when I was, I think I must have been maybe no more than a year old. Um, I was a pretty shit baby, had colic and drove my parents nuts and they palmed me off to the grandparents one day and they took me down to Punt Road for training and yeah. uh, your dad held me and had a, had a photo with him. I think that was my first photo with a Richmond player. So mum reminded oh. me of that last night. I thought, give does, that a run. Does so, the photo exist? It does. My, I'm positive my grandma still got it. I'll try and find it and I'll tweet it to you. Okay, because what we need to do is you need to tweet it to me and then we need to reenact it. Uh, yes. Yep. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I don't know how old you are, but like, you know, 40 years on or whatever it is, here you are again. Maybe, maybe minus the holding part. I won't, I won't get part, him to hold you, but... Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say that they could cause some issues. Uh, but no, definitely, I'd be more than happy to, to reenact it. I'll, uh, I'll definitely ask my grandma where that photo is. I'm sure she's got it somewhere. And that's I'll, I'll a lo- that's, a lovely, that's a lovely story. Because just quickly, I remember my, my favourite player growing up for Richmond was Trent Nichols. And uh, Ooh, I would choice. meet him. At, yeah, I met, oh, you know, that little left footy, because I'm a left footer, left footer rover sort of running around the packs or in the forward pocket. Um, and I, at school, I was always wanted to be Trent Nichols. And uh, I met him several times when I was younger. I'm sure I just annoyed the hell out of him because when dad was coach, I would just, he, I would come to train him and dad would just let me loose around punt road ground. So I would wander in and out and whatever on the field and all that sort of thing. Um, so I'm sure I'd annoy the, the hell out of him. Um, but I haven't seen him in what, 30 years or whatever. So when I, if I was to meet him again, I think I would be very nervous because he was my childhood hero. Yeah, right. Okay. You, surely you got to organize that. That'd be great for you to catch up with him. Yes, uh, he's on my list. Let's put it that way. Fair enough. All right, well, thanks again, Rhett, for coming on. Really Cheers. appreciate your time. And once again, guys, make sure you go out there and buy the book. Uh, it's fantastic. Chock full of history. And also make sure you jump on the website as well. Um, anything you ever want to know about the Richmond Football Club will be there, 100%. Rhett Barlett, thank you again, mate, for coming on. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I'm off to talk about the statue. See ya. <laughs> See you, mate. <laughs> yeah. Cheers, Rhett. There we go, some Richmond royalty right there. What an absolute legend he is. Uh, and the work he does for the club is fantastic. So, uh, there, yeah, special treat for you two guys there, Grok and Tiger Flag. Absolutely, yeah, it was, mate. It was amazing. He, he's just, he knows everything. It's He's fascinating. Um, yeah, it just the work he does is ridiculous and very much appreciated by the Tiger faithful. All right, we'll push on to the, the hot topics at hand. Uh, I know we're obviously very well into it time-wise, but you know what? When you have someone like Rhett Bartlett on, you, you kind of have to, to go with an extended Tiger cast. So we'll get stuck into the preview or the review, sorry, for the round four game versus Port Adelaide, in which we got a sensational win. Richmond 15-9-99 defeated Port Adelaide 14-8-92 by seven points. Um, as I said on the top of the show, I was one who thought we were no chance of winning that game. Um, even at three-quarter time, if I'm being completely honest, I thought we were going to get overrun just with the younger bodies out there. But they sh- they sh- proved me wrong and proved a lot of people wrong, and they showed some serious character to get that win, Grok. What did you make of the game? Yeah, I, th- I was uh, a little nervous heading into the game uh, myself, obviously, with the outs and everything. But it just astounds me that when you look at it, you'd, uh, on the outset, that more Port Adelaide supporters would have picked Richmond to win than Richmond supporters would have picked us to us to win. So it sort of shows that Port knew something we did, and, and that's you know Ken Hinckley's um, you know penchant for losing games that they go red hot favourites in. So yeah, the game itself was was interesting. We, I thought we were all over Port Adelaide in the first ten minutes of the first quarter. Obviously. We just couldn't uh, put the score on the board. I think we ended up at one goal four or one goal five, and then Port kicked a few and, and ended up taking the lead. But it was just a very scrappy game in parts. Obviously, there were a lot of turnovers, and which ended up being Port's uh, major scoring source for the game was turnovers. I think at one point they were on 41 points and had scored 37 points from uh, turnovers from us. So... We sort of shot ourselves in the foot a little bit for, for a lot of the game, but yeah, we just kept grinding and grinding, and I thought our midfield really stood up without Cochin and Martin, which is something you know you didn't think would happen. Um, obviously, through the clearances and the work rate of of um, you know Dion Prestia and Jack Ross and 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 those types, so I thought the game was 
it was scrappy for most of it, but I think we sort of prevailed in the end and got a little bit lucky with that uh, Dersma miss. But at the same time, they shouldn't have been a port shouldn't have been relying on a you know a fourth gamer to give them the game and. Uh, that the ending of that game, four of the last five goals that were kicked were, you know, lead changes. So it was one of those games where I'm sitting there watching uh, in the lounge room with my family, and every time Port kicked a goal, my Collingwood sister would be, you know, ah, oh, suck shit, you know, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose, and then she'd she'd go deathly quiet as soon as we kicked one. I'd get up and about, but that last ten minutes of that game, my heart was just pumping and. I was just a, a racket nervous, but I honestly think that's the best win we've had under Damien Hardwick. Yeah, that's not a bad call. Uh, you mentioned accuracy and goal kicking before, and for anyone who's listened to the show, and you've obviously been on a lot, you'll know that I'm a big uh, stickler for our inaccuracy in front of goal. So the first half, we kicked yeah. six goals eight, uh, which is a disgrace. And the second half, we kicked nine goals one, and look at the difference it made. We ran all over the clock of them. Yeah, so yeah. The old, I, think, uh, I think that's sort of... Yeah, that sort of comes, I think, with our uh, ball entries. We were getting a lot more, we were getting a lot cleaner shots at goal in the second half. A lot of the shots we were having in the first half were coming from like 40 metres out on an angle or were coming in heavy traffic where we just sort of busted the game open in the second half. We were getting a lot more shots inside 30 metres and better angles. So I thought that our, um, you know, our inside 50s were a lot cleaner and a lot more quality than what they were in the, in the first half which makes a difference to accuracy as well, give yourself more of a chance. And Tiger Flag, what about the debut of young Jack Ross? 25 disposals, 4 marks, 5 tackles, 4 clearances, 10 contested possessions, 88% efficiency, 7 score involvements, and 24 pressure acts. That's some kind of debut. That is some kind of debut indeed. And, uh, you know, if uh, there were any sanity in the world, he would have got a, a Rising Star nomination for that one. But, you know, things being what they are. Uh, that went that went to someone else, but uh, no, he was sensational, Jack Ross. Uh, I mean, his debut was as good as Sydney Stacks the week uh, the week before, and uh, I can see those two young gentlemen playing a lot of games for the Tigers in the seniors in the future. He uh, he looks to have uh, pretty much everything there, young Jack Ross. Uh, he's a, he's a, f- a keeper, that's for sure. And what about Tom Lynch? Obviously, we're missing Jack Rewalt. Um, thankfully, we've got Ooh. another big forward there to stand up. Kicked six goals, um, showed a lot of aggression, which I really liked. What did you make of his game? Well, the first thing I noticed about Tommy Lynch, and I did make some notes while I was watching the replay for about the seventh time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in that first quarter, he, he chased a port player. I, I didn't pick up who it was because I don't really notice them too much. Uh, he chased him almost to defensive 50. He just kept running down the ground after this guy. And I thought, yeah. wow, you know, that's, uh, that's a little bit impressive, Tom. You know, if you go... You know, building up the reserves there. You can take a sprint all the way down there. So um, I thought, yeah, his game was, um, you know, he was there and he was copying a lot of attention. A lot of times he was in the in the Jack Rewalt position, you know, three three to one against and all that sort of thing. But he stood up and he wouldn't take any abuse from any of them, although uh, he did get a ridiculous 50-metre penalty paid against him when... Uh, he was not the instigator of the uh, fracas, shall we call it? Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, look, I, I when he first came to the Tigers, I thought, well, I don't know if he's going to fit in, and I don't really, you know, I've seen his highlights reel and all that sort of thing, but I don't know how he's going to stand up, whether he's a, you know, a tough guy or a, you know, a strong player or whatever. But uh, everything I've seen from him so far, he's he's going to be a colossus for us. Yeah, and obviously, you know, it makes such a difference having a having a second key forward target who's now the number one thing is Jack's out, but someone who's not afraid to throw their weight around. Obviously, you know, we've had Vickery, we've had Griffiths, we've had Alton, we've had McBean all come in and try and do that, but they've all lacked that sort of physical intensity and aggression at the contest and the mm-hmm. ball. That, that's something that Tom Lynch doesn't do, and I think that's why he's going to be far more successful than what, you know, people will give him credit for because he he actually attacks the ball and he attacks the contest. He's not afraid of throwing his weight around. And, of, of course, he's a deadly accurate shot at goal, which, I mean, a lot of people forget about. He's, he's pretty accurate and one of these players that you don't really um, you don't really worry when he takes a shot at goal because you know he's going to get really close or he's going to kick it anyway. I think his accuracy is up near the 70% from set shots, which is insane. So, oh. uh, yeah, I think his accuracy is just incredible. 
He, he kicks it like a laser, you know, it just goes. Yeah. And it's just, he looks so laconic when he kicks it from 50 to it. It's like he doesn't put any effort in. It still clears, you know, 55 metres easily. It's like, what's going to happen when he actually decides to latch onto one? Like, his <laughs> kicking is a real weapon. Or well, you'll do the um, Noah Bolter 80 metre job at Preston Oval oh, or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he, yeah. He's another one that just kicks the ball so effortlessly and it just kick, goes 60 metres without, you know, without trying. It's just... It frustrates me because I can't kick over a jam to him. <laughs> and he's, you know, he, he's sitting there kicking at 60 metres without even trying. It's just insane. Yeah, I think it's all in the leverage, you know. Like, Big Griffo used to be able to kick him about 80. Yeah. You know, it's those long limbs and all that sort of stuff. So you get all that momentum through the through the ball as you uh, contact it. Mind you, I've got too much large S to stop the, uh, the, the follow through there these days. So... <laughs> It's, no, it's a handy leave, weapon those I'll boys have. Um, there's obviously a couple of other really key players. Dylan Grimes was obviously outstanding. He made a blunder here or there, but his work in the last 10 minutes was just extraordinary. Uh, Stack played another good game. He had that kick out in the full. And to be honest, a lot of young kids who did that would have gone back into their shell. Um, but he stood tall. He got back to position and he... He stepped up, um, and he was critical again towards the end there, which was fantastic. Yeah. Caddy was another welcome addition. It was really good to have him back. But the player I want to give some credit to, because I, I've knocked him the past few weeks, and a lot of people have, um, and I think, to be honest, we were probably within our rights too, was Brandon Ellis. Um, he's played a lot of yeah. soft games, I think it's probably fair to say, over the past few months, um, and even, even in the back half of last year as well. But his game on the weekend was one of his best games for a long time. And, and not even from a disposal perspective or an efficiency perspective or anything like that. For me, it was the fact, not once did he shirk a contest. When there was a 50-50 ball to be won, he committed to it, won the ball, took the contact, and we come away with an extra possession. Th- those kind of things of what we need to see from on a weekly basis. And hats off to him for playing that kind of game. And I really hope we see more of it. Uh, what did you make of his game, Grok? I thought he had a had an outstanding game, but at the same time, I'm a little bit uh, reticent to give him, uh, you know, credit or you know, applaud the performance because he he needs to back it up. It's always been uh, his problem where he'll have one outstanding game where he'll be you know close to best on ground, and then he'll follow that up with six or seven games where he's ineffectual, panicky, and and is a liability. Like, he just needs to bridge the gap between his best and his worst because at the moment it's just far too great and it happens far too often. So I think while he had an outstanding game against Port Adelaide, it would be interesting to see how he backs that up against Sydney. And, yeah, that, like, like you said, that's the key is the consistency part. So, But hopefully he's now realised what is required of him and what we need him to do to, you know, to get us over the line each week. Because um, if he produces more of that, he's well and truly going to be in the best 22, no doubt. All right, before we move on to the preview of the Sydney game, uh, Grokodok, you actually requested a Tiger Cast takedown. I didn't actually have it scheduled, but uh, you sent the message out. You said, no, nah, this has to be in the rundown because uh, you both want to have a crack at someone or something. I'm like, oh, okay, fair enough. The, that's fine if you want to do it. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, Tiger... Before we start, I believe, I believe we should start with you, seeing as though we just covered the Port game and you had a takedown in regards to that game. Did I? Yes, uh, uh, Adelaide Oval, perhaps? Oh, Adelaide Oval. I, I, did, I did send that, didn't I? <laughs> 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 uh, I forget what I'm messaging just, everyone these could days. I just, could I just make one comment there about the Port game? Yeah. I looked at Ken Hinckley sitting there in the uh, coach's box and I said, Oh my God, that must be that's Doctor Evil out of bloody Austin Powers. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good call. We should get a side by side shot of that up. I reckon. I reckon we should. <laughs> he looks just like him. Um, I won't do my one as a proper takedown, more as a bit of a drive by clip. I'll let you guys have the floor for the takedown. But um, a lot of people were complaining that even pre-game, so when the plays run out the volume of the Richmond theme song compared to the Port Adelaide theme song was quite drastic. You could hardly hear it. And even post-game, the volume was extremely low. To the My sister was at the game, and she even said that she couldn't actually hear what part of the song they were up to being played when trying to sing along. That's how low it was. So just because there's some salty Port Adelaide 
Bogan in the box up there is shitty they lost the game. You shouldn't be depriving the winning team fans of their chance to sing the song. So that's poor form by them. I agree. It was just, yeah, like you play the winner's, you know, song as loud as you can go. Like, you know, especially for the travelling, you know, supporters. Like, why why deny them that? Just yeah. Sour, sour grapes. That's all it is. Agree. But the Tiger Cuts takedown floor, I'll hand over to you guys. Tiger Flag, I'll let you go first, mate. Who are you taking aim at today? Oh, I'm going to take it. aim at the uh, the people who've been involved in the rule changes that they've brought along to us this season um, on behalf of uh, Channel 7. Uh, you know, all those uh, media personalities uh, who think they know all about football and all those people in at AFL House who think they know all about football. Well, the people who know all about football aren't any of you. It's the actual coaches and their coaching teams out there who, no matter what changes you bring in, will find some way to exploit them and turn them around to their advantage. You had all this input from the people in the media. You had input from Channel 7 who wanted more goals scored so that they could show more commercials. And what have you got? Less goals being scored every round. doesn't mean that the footy's any less interesting. It just means that that's a big F for fail, AFL and uh, media personality types. There you go. Boom, yeah, boom. Short and to the point. I like it. Uh, hard to mm. disagree with any of that. Yeah, they've dug themselves a massive hole here. And I'm, I mean, you, would have, you obviously saw my tweet that I retweeted from the, the gentleman who does the stats, whose name escapes me. Um, but the average score, it's the lowest score since somewhere in the 60s, lowest scoring round. Um, I think it was just Is gone. It, so, yeah. Is and that the, Sir Swamp thing that does the stats? Um, it might be related. To, his name's Peter, I think it is. But if it keeps trending down, something has to give at some stage. And yeah, like some of the games are still exciting to watch, yeah. But the fact of the matter is, we were told and fed information that these rule changes were going to get higher scores. Yeah. And it hasn't happened, not even close. So someone's got to be held accountable I mean, for that at some point. Yeah. Wasn't our game the only game this round where both teams scored over 90 points? I wouldn't be shocked if that was the case because yeah, there's a lot of games pretty, that were mid-60s yeah. and 70s. I think, I think, yeah, I think so. you're right there, Grocker Doc. I think it's the only one. Yeah, I think, yeah I think it was the only one. Um, mm. Just Yeah, it was, yeah. No other uh, team, both teams scored, you know, 90 points. Yeah, it's something's, yeah something's got to change soon. But, you, you know, we'll never hear an admission of fault or anything like that along the line, but... Uh, the proof's going to be in the pudding, and I, I don't know how much longer or how much more data they need to collect uh, before people make a call on it, but at the same time, they need to also remember that the only data they collected was two games worth of two bottom teams in the VFL, um, and mm. that was, for them, enough to make the decision to put the rules in. Um, and we're yep. already at double those amount of games, and the data is trending downwards, so we'll see how we go there. Uh, Grokodok, your Tiger Cast takedown. Now, this is probably the other reason why I didn't do one because you're probably going to cover off my rants, which have been very much out there in the Twitter world and on Big Footy anyway. Uh, I'll give you your two minutes. Starts now. Ever since the AFL removed the match review panel and appointed a sole match review officer, fans of the sport have become even more confused and baffled at the glaring inconsistent application of processes used to put to charge players for indiscretions and the failure to apply those same processes to charge others in similar incidents. For example, Alex Rance was fined in 2018 for staging against Essendon after widespread criticism on social media, social media by journalists and supporters alike. However, several players since have received similar backlash and not been fined, including Lance Franklin and most recently Ben Brown, who has developed a reputation f- for staging for free kicks, uh, including being out- outed by Brendan Goddard um, and saying he needs to cut the crap out, essentially. Dustin Martin was suspended initially for two games for Michael Christian in round three, who used the argument that the decision was made on the visual look on the elbow to giant Adam Kennedy that initially struck the shoulder and slipped high, the reaction of the player impacted by the strike and the potential to cause serious injury. All three combined meant that Martin Martin received two weeks as impact was graded as medium. This verdict was overturned after the Richmond Football Club challenged the impact grading and got it downgraded to low. A week later, Patrick Dangerfield attempts two strikes on Matt DeBoer, 70 metres off the play. The first, an elbow, strikes the ball with enough force to double him over. 
The second, a backhand swing, grazes the top of DeBoer's head, and the direct result of these two strikes, a solitary $2,000 fine for the elbow and the backhand, the, the attempted backhand thrown out. Based on the very same criteria used to charge Martin, the look of Dangerfield's strikes were poor, the Boar's reaction was equal to Kennedy's reaction in that they both doubled over and the potential to cause serious injury was just as great as Martin's. Once again, Christian has failed to apply a consistent ruling to similar circumstances and has reviewed two similar situations and come up with vastly different results. In the four rounds completed in 2019 so far, Christian, Christian has had two of his charges laid, challenged at the tribunal, and both have been successful, which shows that Christian is not applying the correct grading systems to the charges and has left a lot of football fans questioning just how gradings are interpreted as similar incidences can receive wildly different outcomes. I strongly urge the AFL to remove Michael Christian from the position of match review officer as he has shown he is inconsistent and incompetent in his duties. The AFL is a sport we are all passionate about and love, and having incompetent people in charge of such things as match reviews and suspending players for indiscretions saps any enjoyment we get out of the game, especially if the suspensions do not follow precedent or are not applied correctly or consistently. Very good. Couldn't have said that better myself if I tried. Um, there's nothing to really add to that. You hit the nail on the head on all counts there. It's getting beyond a joke. Um It'll never change, though, unfortunately. I think we're stuck with him for a little while, but uh, I think yeah. your last point is going to be the interesting one. If more cases go to the tribunal and get overturned, if that keeps happening, then something has to change there, I would have thought. You, you, it's a bad look for the game if it keeps getting yeah. overturned time I after mean, time. Yeah, two successful challenges. is It just shows he's, he's either being too strict or he's not you know, applying the process correctly. And... You know, I can't see how he decides, you know, one week that the look of the game and, you know, you know, potential to cause serious injury, stuff like that can be applied to one incident and then completely ignored seven days later. It just makes no sense to me. No. Uh, yeah, that was the most well, frustrating part. Does it does it matter if you're an AFL poster boy or not? See, I think I think it does. I mean you have a look, Patrick Dangerfield's the AFL Players Association association president so obviously that's going to hold him in good stead he's you know one of the players that's got the the highest marketability you know in the league he's is an ambassador and everything but i think the biggest thing for me is if they had given him another fine for that backhand for an attempted strike that only leaves him with one more fine to go before he gets a one game suspension automatically so i think the afl have left dangerfield a little bit of buffer room in case he does have a little bit of a brain snap again during the season because let's face it dangerfield's not exactly the smartest bloke in the room and he's got a bit of a history of be you know doing those you know little cheap you know, dirty strikes behind play. He's not exactly the saint that Geelong flogs will have you believe he is. So I think that's that's what the AFL's done. They've sort of fined him for the one, let him off for the other. So that way, if he does, you know, get the have another incident later on in the season, he's still got that fine, you know, buffer for him. Because they, they don't suspend Brownlow favourites, let's, let's be honest, because you have a look at Tom Mitchell last year. Like that that was virtually identical to Dusty's this year and Mitchell gets off with it with, you know, nothing and Dang Dusty gets two weeks overturned to one. It's just wildly inconsistent. Oh, you, did you see the elbow we uh, that uh, Tommy threw that time and um he was playing against us and he got Corey Ellis right in the beak. Yeah. You know, blood everywhere, Corey goes off, get his nose put back together or whatever it was. Not even mentioned in the match review. Yeah. Not yeah, at all. No. Nothing. Not just gone. Okay. There you go. How good's that? Yeah, you'd love to be a fly on the wall with some of these decisions, but yeah, I think we're stuck with it for a little while yet. We'll uh, we'll push on to the big preview for the game this weekend, Richmond versus Sydney. Um, a huge game coming. You know, we're coming off the back of a good win and a good chance to. Well, we're only one game behind first spot, along with a lot of other teams. Um, a good chance to really get ourselves up and running uh, as far as the season goes while we're waiting for some plays to come back in. Tiger Flag, what's your take on the game this week, mate? Oh, Tigers by 40 points, minimum. Straight out. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> straight out. I don't muck around, mate. Oh, no, I reckon the Tigers have definitely got this one in their keeping. 
Uh, they should have Dusty back if uh, he decides to play. I think um, the game against Melbourne might be a bit tougher, uh, given that there's only a four-day break. So I think the selection for the team that plays against the Swans will be tempered a little bit by who they reckon they're going to have playing against uh, Melbourne after that short break there. So, I mean, you've got Jack Revolt champing at the bit there, and uh, you've also got um, Dusty to come back in too to fit into the squad. So if either of those two play, that'll affect the balance of the team. I think Hawley might be close to being ready as well. Oh, Basher. Yeah. yeah. You know, as much as I love, I love Basher, I don't love his hamstrings. They um, they worry me. So, you know, I'd want him to be 110%. Yeah, uh, I think they'll definitely they'll, they'll err on the side of caution with him. Um, just That's just how our medical staff tend to go, which is fine by me. Uh, they know best, and they've had a pretty good track mm. record. Uh, what about the matchup for Franklin <laughs> Tiger Flag? Is Grimes, I mean, we've got Asprey. I'm yeah. not sure if Asprey has got the aerobic capacity to go with him. Grimes has probably got that, but lacks the size. Which way do you go? I think if Buddy plays uh, close to the square, it's going to be Asprey. But um, I think Grimes has got the uh, the capacity to take after him there. Mind you, uh, wherever Buddy plays, if uh, Ray Chamberlain is uh, umpiring, he'll get about 40 free kicks for nothing. So uh, that's going to make the matchup even more difficult. But for my money, if, if Buddy's going to play out at centre half forward or half forward uh, around there, I think Dylan will go with him. Fair enough. Uh, and Grok, what's your take uh, on the game this week? Yeah, this one is I'm, I'm a little nervous about because uh, Sydney play Marvel generally pretty well. And obviously Lance Franklin has been down on form and I feel like he's... Uh, due to have a big game, and I wouldn't be surprised if it does happen against us. Obviously, um, he's he's the biggest matchup that we need to worry about being down on you know without Alex Rance, who usually takes him. And I agree with what Tiger Flag said. Obviously, Asprey's going to take um, Buddy when he's you know playing out of the goal square, and uh, Grimes will take him as he pushes up the ground and everything. I think that's probably the best matchup. Um, if not Grimes, he may be broad as he pushes up. But, yeah, I think Sydney have just looked a touch off the pace this year. I mean, they don't have... They're getting exposed on the outside. Their midfield isn't winning the the clearances and the contested ball that they're accustomed to. So, you know, if we can get, you know, get on top in that area, I think our outside game is going to um, be a little bit too much with them. So it's, it's sort of one of those games where I do think we'll win. Uh, I think we'll win by a couple of goals at most. I don't think it'll be... Um, too big either way. Um, but yeah, I think the, the, the midfield battle is going to be where it's going to be won or lost, I reckon. Um, obviously, they've still got Josh Kennedy. They've got Luke Parker. Um, Zach Jones has looked good going through there over the past few weeks. And then, you know, we will have Dusty to come in and it's a toss-up who goes out for Dusty. But um, yeah, with our midfield, I think we generally should get on top. I, I can't really see Sydney posing too much problem for us as long as we can uh, get the ball on the outside and ut- utilise the pace of, you know, Baker and Castagna, Rioli, uh, Sydney stack off the halfback, Noah Bolter. I think our pace will be a, a bit too much for Sydney to, to um, you know, deal with. So I think uh, the biggest matchups uh, be uh, the Franklin one. And Kervis and Sinclair is a battle where I think Nank will probably... Uh, have him covered uh, through the middle, but I think Sinclair's um, more dangerous as he floats forward. He provides a very strong mm, focal point for Sydney up forward, um, and he's shown he can be very damaging. Obviously, with his contested marking, he's a fairly, fairly solid contested mark, and his kicking's not too bad for a ruckman either. And the other one I think we really need to shut down for for Sydney is uh, Isaac Heaney. Um, he's probably their barometer when he's up and about Sydney play well. Um, he's probably been their most targeted player this year in the inside the forward 50 um, because he's just so good overhead and he's, he's deadly accurate in front of goal. And then his ability to go through the middle and, and um, you know, influence through there and bring others into the game. So I do think Isaac Heaney is the number one player we need to shut down for Sydney. Um, so I'd be uh, sort of excited to uh, sort of uh, I won't say excited but 
uh, keen to see who we decide to send to uh, to uh, Heaney. I think Grimes will probably take Heaney when he's not on Franklin, and then uh, you'd probably have one of uh, Waston or Broad take Heaney when he does. I think they're probably the, the best matchups we can probably hope to have at this point. Yeah, I think that's a good call. Heaney is definitely a weapon up forward. I, th- I think we can get Flossie to take a few more speckies and stand on Buddy's head a few more times. Yeah, or how something. good was That'd that? Be nice. Oh, yeah, that yeah. would be so good. He can start making his yeah. own Sydney-based highlight reel. Mm, absolutely. But just with what uh, Grok said there uh, regarding the the midfield there for uh, Sydney, I've noticed. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Luke Parker and Josh Kennedy, and although I do agree they are very good uh, ball getters, they're not fast. They're not fast players. They won't burst away and leave you uh, in their wake or anything like that. I think we have a, a fairly significant advantage if we can get some yeah. first touches in there and uh, really make them pay. Yeah, but that's always agree. been yeah, that's always been Sydney's game plan. They haven't had the pace, so that's why they've they've tried to have a you know such a contested. Um, you know, clogged up game plan. They because they they know if the ball if it's an open, free flowing game, they're going to get burnt on transition time and time again. So they do try and shut the game down, where mm. their inside midfielders can actually you know utilize what their biggest strengths are. Because if it opens up, then their weaknesses are actually going to you know going to be exposed. So that's that's why I think it's it's important for us to try and not get too sucked into a contest and keep players on the outside so we've got that outlet handball to expose Sydney because they have been prone to transition scores over the past 18 months. So I think, you know, for us, we just need to keep our composure, hit that outlet handball or kick uh, and just and push forward as fast as we can. Now, there was the talk about the changes before for us this week. Now, Tiger Flag, if you're on the selection committee, you've got Dustin Martin sitting in the wings waiting to come back in. If oh, you're, in, God, if you're in charge, who misses out? Who's going to miss out? Well, it won't be Jack Ross, I know that much. He'll get another game. Be. <laughs> but, oh, Absolutely yeah, I, I'd, not. I'd Absolutely be filthy. Not. I would yeah, be filthy. I'd be filthy too. Um, Dusty's going to come in. I don't know. They they may drop. Um, if it was me on the selection committee, who would I drop? Up? I hate to say it. Maybe I'd drop Liam Baker. I I personally wouldn't drop Baker. I think his speed and his class and composure are too uh, 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 too much of a weapon for us. I mean, he was mm. pretty pretty cool in that last quarter against Port. He just stood out. I think for me, the one that we drop for Dusty, if he's not going to play a tagging role, would have to be Jack Graham. I mean, he's not really influencing on the scoreboard like he did last year when he wasn't getting a heap of the ball. Obviously, Jack Ross has come in and is sort of showing the showing what we hoped Graham would be. And if he's not playing as a tagger on Kennedy or Parker, I think Graham mm. would be the one to, to make way. That's I it. That's it. it. Yeah. I agree. I, think I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all the others have too many, you know, strengths or weapons where which Graham doesn't have, to be honest. Yeah, I think uh, just watching Jack, you know, when he played on the uh, the weekend there, and I thought he just looks out of sorts at the moment. He's, um, I don't know, he's he's like um, an audio recording that's out of sync between channels. He's just not, you know, getting to the right spots at the right time. He's not hammering his tackles like he, he should be, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. He's still he's, getting some you know, good numbers defensively, though, which we know Hardwick he typically loves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why. That, that's why I, yeah, without any certainty, have no idea who they're going to drop. And um, I, I would contemplate personally Castagna because um, we've got a lot of other small guys who can go for it. I think his form has been shocking the last couple of weeks. He's not kicking goals. That handball he missed to Kane Lambert on a <laughs> counter attack. I nearly threw the remote through the TV. Um, oh. He can't make those mistakes at the top level. Uh, I'm just not sure if he needs a spell just to gain some confidence, but. Yeah, as for who comes in for Dusty, it's it's anyone's guess, but it's going to be a big call no matter which way it goes. Well, they yeah. might drop they might drop uh, old mate Connor Minadu there. You know, he, he's, yeah, he's, 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 he's he's one of our favourite whipping boys. Poor old Connor. I think if Hooley comes back, I think they drop Connor for Hooley. Yeah. Um, obviously, like for like, as that half back flanker. But, yeah, I think Castagna would probably be the one that does make way for Dusty. 
Uh, and then we can sort of push Lee and Baker more towards that half forward role rather than as that sort of small inside mid that he was playing towards he, the end of the game. I must and, admit though, he surprised me, Lee and Baker. He played that role well. I was really surprised to see how many yeah. how many more dimensions he has to his game than just being a small forward. And this is this is the biggest thing at VFL level. He plays a lot through the midfield at VFL level and for someone with his stature, you know, he's not exactly short and he's not the stockiest bloke going around. He cracks in so hard. Like, he does. He does crack in real hard. I've seen him play uh, a fair bit of VFL uh, since yeah. he got down the club there. And, you know, to me, he seems like he's... I oh, know he's just a little way off being a, a, a yeah. regular uh, senior AFL player, but I will, yeah. I will say about George though, um, Dimmer does love him, and it's not, uh, it's not just the you know, it's, I think he tends to overlook some of the skill errors there. <laughs> it's the chasing, it's his uh, contesting in the air, bringing the ball to ground if he doesn't mark it. There's a lot of things George does. I think that he does. Uh, That's fair. Go That's a, a bit underrated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. I'm not. I'm not one to bag any of our players, but um, yeah, poor old Georgie seems to cop uh, a fair bit. Uh, interesting selection time coming up. All right, before we let you guys go, we'll get a final tip, including margin. Grock, I'll start with you. Uh, Tigers by sixteen for me. Fair enough. And Tiger flag. Oh, I think I went for the Tigers by forty, Straight doing it fairly right. comfortably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sticking on, with on, that. Yeah, but only if uh, Ray's not umpiring. Ray or Curtis or Dean? Oh, Curtis the boy. I'll never <laughs> please him. Oh, we're due, man, for, a, we're due for a negative free kick count this week, fellas. We've had two positives in oh. a row. It can't keep happening. I saw I saw Josh Caddy kick a goal from 50 out on the on the intersection of the 50-metre arc and the boundary line. And Jack Rewalt, you know, nudged the guy in the side to shepherd oh, it through. Yeah, yeah. Free, he's he's disallowed it, and I've just gone, What? Do yeah. you even know the rules, mate? And he pinged Jaden Short for deliberate. Oh, yeah. And and the best one was when, um, I think it was against, uh, who was it? It was uh, Fremantle. And he umpired us in the game there. And the ball's up in the forward uh, line there. And I think it was David Mundy and uh, Alex France were uh, wrestling up there. And umpire Rosebury was about five metres away. And he said, no, nah, play on. You were both wrestling. And old Curtis, he's like 70 <laughs> metres away, overrules him, pays a free kick to him. Goal. Yeah. That annoys me. I was just going, you've got to be kidding. Again, again. Oh. Like they, they have zonal umpires, and I'm of the belief with the way it's going now, <laughs> they should only allow the, the umpires in the actual zone to pay free kicks. Because it's just ridiculous. You've got an umpire 10 metres where you can see the contest perfectly, say play on, then you've got someone 70 metres downfield who's, whose view's obstructed paying a free kick because they guessed what happened. It's just... <laughs> It's so frustrating. Uh, yeah. yeah, but it was so funny when it happened because you could hear the explanation from Rosebery is you were both wrestling, play on, and then yeah. you, the other guy overrules him and Rosebery looks around at him and he's got a look on his face of like, you serious? <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know that he was too happy with the overrule either. Well, fingers crossed we avoid him this weekend. Uh, but Grokodok and Tiger Flag, thanks so much for coming on, guys. And another special thanks to Rhett Bartlett for coming on earlier as well. Oh, really appreciate your time tonight, fellas. Oh, yeah, look, too, no I'm only too happy to come on. Thank you very much for inviting me. I had a real hoot, and it was great to uh, have a listen to Rhett there and organise my next appointment with the statue. <laughs> <laughs> or, or better yet, his dad. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good outcome for you. You've done really well there. Oh, absolutely, mate. Yeah. I had to work my way on the show to get that one in. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, guys. Until next time, go Tigers. Yeah, go Tigers. Thanks, Mike. Go Tigers. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Richmond Big Footy Tiger Cast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and YouTube so you can follow all the roasts and toasts, the reviews and previews, and all topics Richmond. Also keep an ear out for our special episodes of interviews with past players. Go Tigers!